नमस्कार गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम वेलकम टू स्टडी आई क्यू आई एस इंग्लिश माई नेम इज भुवन अपूर बुझा एंड दिस इज द एडिटोरियल एज एज वी बिगिन इन अनदर वीक अनदर मंथ वी आर ऑलरेडी इन अक्टूबर एंड सो विल सी दैट सम ऑफ द करंट अफेयर्स टॉपिक्स दैट वी हैव से डिस्कस प्रीवियसली यू नो नाउ दे विल फाइंड रेपिटेशन एंड समटाइम्स द रेपिटेशन विल बी एन अपडेशन और से द इफेक्ट यू नो द कॉज इन द इफेक्ट दैट वी विल ड्रॉ एन ड्रॉ एन स्टैब्लिश between uh, say the current affairs that's coming up okay so on the agenda today i have three topics for you number one is the carbon border adjustment mechanism you know uh, it has been in the news we have discussed this previously say in uh, around june okay so now we are seeing that what we had discussed earlier that now is being put in motion the transition phase of the carbon border adjustment mechanism that we had discussed that was to happen say in uh, from october first week that's beginning that's already begun so we'll take a look at an exhaustive look at what the carbon border adjustment mechanism is what are its key facets what is its ramification for india and what exactly should india look to do you know we'll seek to understand that number 1 number 2 we'll go ahead and take a look at high speed railways in india specifically why because china recently announced uh, fujian railway it's first of its kind over the sea railway okay and and what you find is say china that begun its high speed railway network in what 2008 yes it's not been very long it's been around 15 years and they have grown expansively what you find is that from 2008 onwards in a span of around 15 years okay you are looking at them having built 50000 close to 50000 kilometers of high speed railway network so what are the learnings from china and what is the indian uh, status what is the indian status uh, update in so far as our high speed railway link is concerned that's agenda number 2 and third article is an article that i had shared on my telegram channel about a particular plant named as named as google okay and that is found in kutch now uh, i shared the article so i hope those of you who have read the article will be able to better relate to it but we'll discuss the key facets of what exactly is google you know is it a critically endangered or an endangered plant what is it known for and why is it that say it has gone to such a level you know how could we let a plant like google or any plant for that matter become critically endangered you know and what is the gujarat forest uh, state department doing in so far as reviving this particular species is concerned so that's going to be agenda number 3 as always we'll take a look at questions not just from these three topics but also from the topics of the last class meanwhile Many of you have sent me your answers for uh, the mains question that we had put forward last year, uh, last week, and uh, I have received very good answers. You know, close to around 50 answers is what I am working on right now. I have started responding to each one of them individually, and so uh, you will see that if you have sent in your answers, you will receive a response from me latest by lunch today. Okay, Bulbul, Coder, Bhageshri, your neighbor, Geetanj. Good morning, guys. I'm sorry, firstly for the slight delay, but I had tried my update. I tried to my best to update you all. not just on telegram but also here on my youtube uh, chat box right shall we get started then okay let's get into it this is my instagram id by the way where you can go ahead join a very small and a very strong community you know of students who join early in the morning as well as those who are a part of the study iqs prelims to interview process whereas this is my email id where you find that most of the students have sent their mains answers this is the telegram channel where you will find the entire pdf of this lecture uploaded at around noon also the articles that are regularly shared here questions that are regularly shared here eventually to make sure that you are not spammed you are given the information that is required in so far as coverage of your geography environment your international relations economics all of that is concerned okay right so carbon border adjustment mechanism now the european union firstly the body that is responsible for it now it had announced the that under this particular mechanism it is going to levy a carbon tax on imports of products which essentially why right now let's understand it as a lagan okay let's break it down so essentially pranjal good morning welcome welcome so essentially the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a lagan that the european union has decided to put on those products that according to it are not made from environmentally sustainable products or are non green in nature okay so now here it is the first statement gives away the in inherent disparity in this uh, concept okay that say uh, environmental uh, sustainability and non green infrastructure and technology is is capital intensive 
which is why you find that say many countries the developing countries of say asia countries in africa may not have those processes that could be considered to be say carbon non intensive or say green in the eyes of european union so therein is the inherent unfairness of this principle too let's understand and go ahead what the rest of the matter is okay the cbam the carbon border adjustment mechanism it's a part of fit for 55 in 2030 package which is essentially their plan to reduce ghg emissions by at least 55% by 2030 eventually they are looking to go ahead and that they become net zero right so the long term ob objective it will ensure that eu's climate objectives are not undermined by carbon intensive imports and spur cleaner production in the rest of the world right so essentially can you understand the inherent problem here that you are asking the rest of the world to go ahead and make cleaner systems green systems okay that you are willing to go ahead and levy a particular tax on it a lagan on it but in terms of say your contribution in making sure that these say developing nations poor nations have the ability at least the capital to make these kind of green infrastructure the european union says well we have nothing to do with it yet how is that possible then is it not unfair that you had the first the first capture of resources which allowed you to go ahead and build your infrastructure which created a polluting uh, atmosphere in the first place okay and now what you find is that when the other countries are trying to do the same thing you go ahead and levy a particular tax the carbon border adjustment mechanism okay so the reporting has begun by the way 1st of october which is essentially the transition phase right now okay what you find is that currently from the 1st of october the transition phase of the carbon border adjustment mechanism has begun and eventually this financial levy this extra tax that is to be levied on these so called carbon intensive imports from so called carbon intensive countries made using uh, say non green infrastructure that is going to be levied from 2026 so around what 3 years from now okay but right now they are going to go ahead and collect data so uh, imports of say steel of aluminum all of those companies now have to go ahead and submit a certificate saying what was the process under which it was made okay and thus you find let's go forward so how are you going to go ahead and implement it look at this now firstly the cbm applies to products roughly in steel aluminum electricity fertilizer cement essentially the core industries that we know of guys okay now requiring imports to declare the quantity of goods imported and their embedded greenhouse gas emissions okay you are going to go ahead and do it on an annual basis right currently the data sharing that is happening between these countries and the european union that began from the 1st of october is to be submitted on a quarterly basis but eventually this will be done on an annual basis okay so to offset these emissions now what do i i as an importer so i am a ceo of a steel company based in say india and i want to go ahead and send my steel to europe so what do i need to submit first surrender a corresponding number of cbam certificates right so essentially it's like carbon trading i go ahead and submit certificates and guess what the price of those certificates is not fixed okay it's variable it changes from week to week the price of which will be based on the weekly average auction price of the european union trading system now what happens if a country does not have say a carbon trading system can can you guys very quickly let me know if india has a carbon trading system do we have a carbon trading system guys what happens can you expect say poor nations to have a trading system in place okay or say companies that want to go ahead and export goods from those poor developing countries aspirational countries okay do they have that mechanism that incentive that sort of infrastructure that the european union so requires under its carbon border adjustment mechanism saurabh good morning munikrishna good morning thanks for joining guys right so that is the problem guys that that's what i wanted to identify otherwise the questions from the prelims perspective is quite straight forward here but from the mains perspective you have to understand that there is an inherent element of not being fair when it comes to cbam okay <clears throat> okay let's look at some related concepts here now firstly you know when you look at say what you could do to go ahead and deal with this problem so on the domestic front you find that well the government of india has schemes like the national steel policy the production linked incentive scheme all of that why 
to go ahead and say increase India's production capabilities, right? But you often find that say the PLI or the National uh, Steel Policy, it does not talk much about the uh, say uh, carbon efficiency objectives of those schemes, okay? So when it is not a part of our policy making process anyways, yes, that concept has not percolated to that extent. How is it that India is going to be affected is one question, okay? So what is being suggested is that you go ahead and have the government of India complement these schemes such as the PLI or say the national uh, steel policy. You go ahead and complement these particular schemes with a decarbonization principle. Okay, so let's understand what is the decarbonization principle now. Okay, if, it's, if this is one of the suggestions in so far as how India can go ahead and counter this whole CBAM project by the European Union. So what is the decarbonization principle? Okay, essentially you're looking at those processes of reducing or eliminating greenhouse gas emissions, particularly carbon dioxide. Okay, not just carbon dioxide by the way. So herein is a question I can frame straight away for your uh, MCQs using the word only, you know. So keep an eye out whenever you are looking for terms like particularly this, particularly that. It means it's one of the many. It's not the only one. So if for example, if I go ahead and give a statement to you that decarbonization is the processes wherein you are looking to limit the emission of carbon dioxide only. Is it a true statement or a false statement? You know, it's a false statement. Why? Because it's not just carbon dioxide, but particularly carbon dioxide. The other GHG gases, the other greenhouse gases that you know of are included under this principle. Okay. So from human activities such as transportation, power generation, manufacturing and agriculture. This is one method in which India can go ahead and counter this whole pro problem. The second way is that you go ahead and parallelly negotiate with the European Union for a sort of concession. Yes, for some sort of tax reduction, given that India does not have the infrastructure at a scale level, at a large scale level, to go ahead and say, make its exports competitive in the face of this carbon border adjustment mechanism. Correct? Kalyan, you're absolutely correct. It's a false statement. True. Say bol So what should India look to do then? So India could negotiate with the European Union to recognize its energy taxes. You know, we do have energy taxes on our bodies that we put. So can we go ahead and include them as a part of a carbon price? You know, can we show that yes, the taxation is being held locally, you know? And so if you go ahead and tax a particular body twice, you're looking at double taxation again. You know, so many concepts now intertwined in something so simple as the carbon border adjustment mechanism, specifically from the purpose of means, from the purpose of interview, from the purpose of prelims, it's a very, it's relatively straightforward concept, okay? So carbon leakage, the situation may occur for if reasons of cost related to climate policies, now the businesses in European Union say, we will go to those countries that have laxer, laxer image, uh, emission constraints, you know? So it's a problem that European Union now has created for itself. You realize that? That if you want to go ahead and set up a factory in European Union or import goods, either ways, you are looking at, say, uh, putting an extra money on it. It's going to be a little expensive. What if as a CEO of a company, I say, I'm going to move my business out of it anyways. You know, I'm going to move to a particular country that provides me cheap labor and does not have taxes that are arbitrary. Right? So this is one of the concepts that you need to be aware of. Okay? So the imported channels, how can this happen? This carbon leakage. As a CEO of a company, what are the things that I can do? Number one, firstly, energy markets. Yes, that the European Union will lose out access to energy markets, at least say a quality access to energy markets. Why? Because companies will be much more tempted to move out their businesses from the European Union. Right? Competition. Due to costs of European Union climate policy, the industry relocates production. What I am suggesting right now. And free riding. Okay, note this term by the way, free riding, good concept. Once again, something as simple as this, you, uh, the UPSC goes and asks you, which of the following sectors is the term free riding associated with? And guess what, one of the two options will be subsidies, don't mark that. Okay, so because of European Union climate policies, others see less pressure to act and hence increase their emissions. Yes, that again, it's an arbitrary policy. It, it, it does not uh, have the equity sense in it, which is why you find that many countries will be tempted to circumvent this 
by their by using their own ways and means would you agree with me class let me know okay so let's look at the impact on our country india so we're looking at these particular sectors that will be primarily affected iron steel and aluminium okay now why because once again the problem so arises that our carbon intensity or the amount of emissions generated from say a particular unit of product you know that is quite high we are primarily a coal based economy you know we are still transitioning obviously india goes and says that okay by 2070 we are looking at net zero emissions but 2070 is what almost 50 years from now you know and this tax is right now okay and even though say india has made major strides in so far as this target is concerned it will find it difficult in the short term to negate this arbitrary tax that has been put by the european union okay so india has no domestic carbon pricing scheme in place again a greater risk to export competitiveness yes that is also one lacuna that we lack lack the policy framework behind it okay and thus what i suggested right now can you go ahead and negotiate parallelly with the european union after all we are one of the world's major economies okay top 5 economies you know so can we go ahead and have a parallel channel of negotiation to make sure that the indian export competitiveness is not affected okay this is going to be key in the days to come meanwhile what you find is that from uh, the 1st of october the reporting for this process has begun financial levy which means the taxes will eventually come into action from 2026 onwards right so have a look at this slide it gives you a overview of what is the expectation in so far as carbon border adjustment mechanism is concerned let's look at the question that i have for you guys and what you are going to do is you are going to leave the answer for me in the comment box as you have been doing okay i have been very pleased and in fact i have been very motivated by looking at the response of not just the mcqs but also the mains question which is why you i i'll suggest the rest of you to those who are watching this later go ahead and try and answer the questions it's for your own benefit okay statement 1 decarbonization involves reducing the levels of co2 only and excludes agriculture sector from its purview true or false statement 2 the indian carbon mechanism is being developed by the bureau of energy efficiency true or false and common but differentiated responsibility cbdr okay now if these are completely greek and uh, italian and all of those uh, languages to you then well i think uh, your ncert will be your best friend or what you can do is go ahead and connect with study iq english as this week we will be re will be restarting the aranya series the environment focus series so which all of these concepts will be discussed uh, therein so uh, that will be advisable for those of you who might have difficulty figuring out what's a carbon mechanism what is sequestration all of the basic concepts the fundamental concepts okay so identify the incorrect statements from the three statements above right my friends before i go forward here is an announcement now regardless of whether you are preparing for say 2024 2025 or 2026 okay here is a one stop solution what you are going to do is look at this prelims to interview this foundation course okay new foundation course prelims to interview and now what you can go ahead and do is choose your validity of your course yes so if you are preparing for say 2026 you go ahead and choose a two year validity okay and you start your classes now because the thing is that eventually the focus should be begin early give yourself the best chance in so far as your first attempt is concerned any student will tell you you know that the first time you go ahead and walk into the prelims uh, hall is the best attempt regardless of how how you fare you know you could score very poorly or very high but you will go in with a clear head and so it's uh, a prerequisite that that clear head be backed with right knowledge right guidance and right question solving ability give yourself the best chance to clear in the first attempt or the first two attempts itself okay so well what you are going to do is look at this particular course i am associated with the english and the english the bilingual batch okay and uh, physics environment ir csat are my areas of interest so if you resonate with the way i go ahead and communicate my ideas and and say the deliverables that are uh, important for a student then go ahead and sign up for this asap okay use the code be alive you get allotted to my batch and then we begin what could possibly be a uh, life changing uh, year for you right so here it is the new foundation prelims to interview course by study iq okay yes pranjul i am ac absolutely excited myself too you know i am looking forward to the aranya series many students have reached out to me including you pranjul 
And so I wouldn't like to hold it any further. You know, let's start. Let's get cracking on the RNA series because we have a long way to go. We have done what three, four classes. So we'll get it done ASAP. You know, it's time now. October आ गया तो it's time. Okay, high speed railway. HSR by the way. Okay, high speed railway, also known as HSR. So what you find is China. They recently went ahead and unveiled their latest marvel in transportation, a high speed bullet track located in Fujian province. which is set to redefine cross sea travel okay they are making their bullet trains crossing seas now and so what you find is that as a country in 2008 began this chinese aim of having uh, linking the different parts of the country through high speed rail or what we know as say bullet trains okay and in 15 years they have roughly gone close to around 45000 kilometers with an aim of 50000 kilometers in the next 2 years okay massive level of uh, industrialization infrastructure development backed by its heavyweight industries okay so let's look at it traveling at a consistent speed of 350 kilometers per hour this is the chinese speed by the way now when you look at say the indian uh, uh, bullet trains our high speed railway networks now different speed limits are being proposed however in terms of the delhi ahmedabad 320 km per hour is the current uh, target that has been put forward by the uh, consortium okay so currently china boasts the world's largest high speed rail network now here it is look at this comparative chart that i have for you 2008 you just had two lines in fact three lines that's all and 15 years later here is this wired mesh right so you can understand the level of development that has gone in in the last 15 years correct so now 50000 km railway link in the next 2 years and this journey began in 2008 with the beijing to tianjin link not very important again what you have to realize is how china has fared and in what amount of time okay because eventually if you have to draw a comparative analysis you need to have a preliminary idea of how the competitor is doing okay so what you find is that the benchmark set by the chinese government is quite high let's look at how india is doing now okay what you find is at present the mumbai ahmedabad high speed railway project is the only sanctioned high speed railway project okay so the mumbai ahmedabad starts from ahmedabad then anand vadodara bharuch surat valsad wapi bhaisar virar thane and bandra kurla complex okay this is currently under development okay with assistance both financial and technical from japan the shinkansen okay you must have heard of this the shinkansen so it has twin complementary objectives okay so what are the objectives besides say linking ahmedabad and mumbai obviously this is part one of it that you will go ahead and say link them quickly what else number one localized manufacture make in india that eventually indigenously you have to go ahead and develop this even though yes you are getting assistance you are getting financial assistance and technical assistance from the government of japan and number two you are looking at transfer of technology that eventually the ability to go ahead and develop such railway networks autonomously must lie with an indian agency okay that yes the hand holding right now is being done by the japanese government but eventually the indian government is looking at creating local level capacity so that we can go ahead and create these kind of high high speed railway networks throughout the country okay karuna good morning welcome welcome thank you for joining guys okay so twin objectives so if the examination asks you know about the railway high speed railway projects obviously number one will be say creating modern railway infra yes that you are going to create 320 km per hour railway link between say various areas but besides that make in india and transfer of technology okay so the projects in pipeline now the detailed projects report the dpr has been prepared for which of these delhi varanasi delhi ahmedabad mumbai nagpur mumbai hyderabad chennai bengaluru mysore delhi chandigarh amritsar varanasi howrah now besides say the connotations here let's understand one thing guys do you understand that when you say look at the map of india yes the map of india what you find is that if say this is delhi and this is howrah okay so this link from delhi to havda where you cross pandit din dayal upadhyay railway station formerly known as mughal sarai okay so this entire stretch what you find is that the track utilization 
which is essentially how many trains are running, you know, the track utilization is higher than 100%, okay, which means no new trains can be added to this link until and unless you create more, say, railway lines, that it is running to full capacity, in fact, more than full capacity. What happens is, if you are running more than 100%, you are going to shorten the distances between two trains. What ideally could have been, say, a kilometer's distance between the engine of train B and the last bogey of train A, yes, now that distance is getting reduced, which means more and more, say, safety problems may so arise, right? So, why this is why you find that most of these high-speed railway links, excluding one, Varanasi to Havra, excluding one, most of them are in the western theatre or the western sector of Indian railways, western zones, different zones, okay? This is the primary reason you find that most of the modern railway development insofar as introduction of high-speed rails or say Vande Bharat is happening in the sector from say uh, West Bengal, uh, from uh, Delhi to Mumbai, okay? Or say the western part. Havda, New Jalpaiguri has not get, got that much of the uh, rub of the green. Why? Because again, the track utilization is absolutely high. It's, it's brim to capacity, okay? So, you look at these particular projects. Now, you need to realize why I went ahead and uh, spoke this for you because the east part of Indian Railways observes this phenomenon, especially when you go from, say, New Delhi to, say, Havra, crossing Patna, Pandit Dindayal, Upadhyay uh, Railway Station, Kanpur. The whole stretch sees a lot of, uh, hundred, more than 100% track utilization. Okay? Right? Let's go ahead and answer this. Now, this is a very tricky question. No? Somehow, most students would struggle with this. Why? Because again, local level uh, geography mapping is a little difficult. So, well, that's the whole agenda of this whole art that we go ahead and solve questions, look at topics from all angles. Okay? Understand it in a manner in which we answer questions in prelims aram se. And more importantly, we are going to go ahead and say, write good analysis in the mains. Okay? So, arrange the following stations of Mumbai Ahmedabad high speed railway project from south to north. So, when you are going from Mumbai to Ahmedabad, which station comes first, which station comes last? Okay, Bharuch, Surat, Vadodara, Anand. You will let me know your answers in the comment box. Right, my friends, any problems related to the particular two topics that we discussed, this is where you reach out to me. Okay, don't be hesitant. I always tell this to my students, don't carry forward your doubts. Yes. So, reach out to me if you have any particular issues related to the topics that we discussed today. Meanwhile, look at this. I shared this article, by the way, in my Telegram channel. And I was happy to see a few students ask me questions related to this just after reading the particular uh, article. Okay. So, let's look at it. Kutch is Google. Now, Google is essentially a native plant. Here it is. This dry plant that you see growing in the semi-arid region of Kutch. Okay. Known as Google. And what you find is that it has extensive medicinal value. Okay. Here are a few facts about Google first. Okay. Besides, obviously, that it is critically endangered as listed by the IUCN. More importantly, what you find is that Google, the, the particular tree, you know, its, its bark has its raisin. So, a tree like this, for example, okay, it will take roughly what, 7 to 8 years to develop. Okay. 7 to 8 years for maturity. After that, you as a farmer go ahead and say cut its bark, take out the raisin. You expect to get no more than say 200 to 300 grams of raisin. But bear in mind, this 200 to 300 grams sells for a lot of money in the market. Why? Because it is considered to have extensive medicinal properties, especially in the Ayurveda uh, uh, line of treatment. Okay? So, let's look at it. Overexploitation has led to it being declared critically endangered by the IUCN. Now you understand why overexploitation. Okay. Firstly, sale of rate is high. Okay. You had this that caught on, you know. Eventually, earlier it used it, it wasn't sold for that higher price. But as commercialization of Google went on, what you find is rampant overexploitation of this plant happened to the point that it almost went extinct in the Kutch area from where it is endemic, by the way, it is endemic to the area, okay? So, Mitho Google, a species from the same family is also endangered and has high medicinal value and now awaits similar conservation attention, okay? So, two types of Google we are looking at. One is Mitho Google, one is Google. One is critically endangered, the primary Google one 
and the Me Too Google is endangered. Both of them again under stress for the same reasons that humans have gone ahead and over exploited it for commercial benefit. Okay. So look at it. The oleo gum resin tapped from the stem. So you go ahead, take the stem, break it, take the bark, go ahead, tap the resin from, from out from it. Okay. And you find that it is highly in demand in the herbal industry. Okay. Use of this plant in the treatment of diseases occupies an important place in the Ayurveda line of medicine, which is why the whole co over exploitation for commercial benefit. Okay. So let's look at the resin. This is what it looks like, guys. Yes, almost looks like kishmish, if, if, if you can see it properly. Okay. So what are the f uses of it? Uses as an antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, blood cholesterol, bone fracture, arthritis, think of it. Many, many medicinal uses. Okay. So India used to export Google earlier. Now export is banned. Why? Again, critically endangered, just didn't announce. Ho gaya. You cannot go ahead and uh, export it anymore. That would be a contravention of all the particular laws that are in place. So no ways you can go ahead and export it. Okay. It is endemic to Kutch. Long gestational period, 7 to 8 years for maturity. Raisin generated 200 to 300 grams, which sells at a high price. Okay. So now what you find is that the Gujarat Forest Department has gone ahead and introduced sustainable forestry insofar as the Google is concerned. That saplings are now provided every year. Because again, you re realize that the sapling takes at least eight years to become a tree. And after that, the moment you take the raisin out from the tree, the tree dies. So which means you need a continuous supply of this tree so as to make sure that say at the local level, you have a particular say, a model of economic uh, development that comes out of this particular species, right? So the Gujarat Forest Department has taken a major uh, role in this. Every year you find Google saplings now being uh, planted, being given to villagers. Eventually they are given the responsibility of say seven to eight year cycle that comes with the particular sapling now becoming a big tree. Okay. So you'll remember the Google tree endemic to Kutch area. Kutch area is a favorite of the civil services examination earlier. It has asked questions on I think each of them. Okay. It has earlier asked questions on Kharai camel. It has asked questions many times on Indian bustard, on wild ass. So you'll let me know. Okay. Which of the above may be found in Kutch in Gujarat? If you have ever been to say Kutch, ever had the good fortune of visiting that place, you must have noticed at least one or two of them. Okay, so you let me know. Karai camel, great Indian bustard, Indian wolf, wild ass. Which of these can be found in Kutch? Right, my friends, that concludes uh, this morning's three topics that I had for you. You'll find the PDF of this here on the Telegram channel. Meanwhile, let's look at the questions of the last class. Okay. The whole focus is on question solving, as you must have noticed. So let's look at it. New Caledonia in the Pacific Ocean is an overseas territory of which of the above? In the last class, we discussed Zealandia, the new eighth proposed continent, right? And therein we found that, well, New Caledonia is very close to Zealandia. You know, it's a part of, say, the Zealandia continent. So, where, which, which, who controls New Caledonia? You find that France, it's the uh, primary holder of the Caledonia project. Okay. Let's look at this. Identify the incorrect options. Continental boundaries are defined by plate boundaries. Plates can contain both land and oceans. Indo-Australian plate is a fully continental plate. Now many wrong answers. Okay. Why? Because I asked fundamentals. This is what happens, you know. The fundamentals need to be absolutely clear. So let's go ahead and have a look at the fundamentals. This is your, if, if you're looking at the plate boundaries of different plates around the world. Now let's go ahead and say, look at Football. Okay, let's look at South America. Okay, what you find is that the continental boundaries are nowhere near the plate boundaries. That a particular continent and an ocean can be a part of a plate, right? So what does that tell you? That a particular plate may have continental plus ocean elements, and that it is not necessary that the continent boundary should be the plate boundary, right? You have certain plates that are fully continental, right? For example, you look at the Eurasian plate. Okay. It's considered to be continental plus has some elements of say oceans. Okay. But in terms of the Indo-Australian plate, okay, the Indo-Australian plate, what you find is that it has again both elements of continental and oceanic. It is not a fully continental plate. Okay. So the answer is now. Let's understand this. Continental boundaries are defined by plate boundaries. Unfortunately, no. Okay. Plates can contain both land and oceans within them. Yes, please. 
Indo Australian plate is a fully continental plate, unfortunately, no again, which means my incorrect options are A and C. Okay, many of you got this incorrect, which I was uh, slightly surprised by, right? So, go ahead and uh, make sure that you revise your plate tectonics, you know, just a quick revision, 10 minute revision, look at the different plates, especially again, why? Because you have had, say, two uh, different uh, major events recently, yeah, the earthquake uh, near the Nubian plate, the North Africa plate as well as this particular continent now that has been discovered and proposed, Brazilandia, okay. It makes sense for a student to be absolutely updated on plate tectonics, okay. Right, next question. Which of the above may be considered as remnants of Parathethys Ocean? So, here you had <coughs> Laurentia, here you had Gondwana, yes, formerly part of the Pangaea, you had Panthalassa, which was all around. Once these two broke up, you had a formation of a new sea in the middle and this came to be known as Tethys, okay, or Paratethys and what you find is that eventually, this is a story that is a long way ago, but today, off late, what you find is that the Tethys now has been reduced to essentially three oceans, primarily, number one is the Mediterranean Ocean, number two, the Black Sea, okay, and the Caspian Sea. It also has two more bodies to it, yes, we will go ahead and have a look at them. Okay, but the uh, Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal are nowhere near to Paratethys, right? So, the answers here being A, B and C. Once again, plate tectonics, my friends. Right, which of the above may be considered as the continentality effect? Yes, your land, your ocean, right? The more nearer you are to the ocean, yes, the more under the influence of the moderating effect of the ocean you will be. The more far away you are from the ocean, well, the ocean plays hardly a factor in the local uh, climate there, the weather there, okay. So, it is to do with the distance from the sea or the oceans, right. So, answer being D here. Right, which of the above is used in deployment of airbags? We discussed airbags in detail, you know, the whole story of the different components that have been used in airbags over the years, right. And what you find is that today you have the use of sodium azide that is used. Earlier, you had ammonium nitrate that is the same material that you use in your fertilizers that was used. Unfortunately, the state, the solid state of that could not be maintained. It became explosive in certain uh, 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 certain uh, uh, methods, okay. You also had tetrazole that was used earlier, but that was far too expensive. So, the correct answer right now is that D. Sodium azide is used as the particular, say, explosive which sets off the airbag in the event of a catastrophic collision, right? Okay, let's look at my fine individuals <coughs> who have been answering these questions correctly. You might have got that question about plate tectonics incorrect, okay? So, my suggestion would be just give it 15 minutes of revision, right? Pooja, Ulfat, Monica, Harshit, Shubham, Sriram, Akansha, Gopesh, Kalyan, Crystal, Vidisha, Hani, Vaishnavi, Koder, your neighbor, Aditya, Ayush, Frown Clown, Rahul and Akshay. Guys, thank you firstly, you know, every morning I should thank you. Why? Because it takes continuous effort to go ahead and solve questions. But I am happy to see you engage with this. Why? Because you will realize eventually, if you keep at it, you will be much at ease when it comes to solving questions, you know. And to the rest of you, if you are not engaging here, well, regardless of that, what I can suggest is that make question solving your priority, you know. Your selection in the examination is co-dependent on two things. Number one, is a knowledge base, which I can assure you, a serious candidate, many serious candidates, in fact, most of them will have a similar knowledge base before the examination. The selection now then gets focused on whether you are able to solve questions. Those questions, those individuals who have made question solving their focus over the last six, seven, eight months will be a lot more comfortable than someone who's just started solving questions, say, in February or March, okay? So, don't make that mistake. Solve MCQs. Start with your mains answer writing whenever you find a question of relevance and uh, so do that. It will eventually help you a lot. Why? Because we are in October, you know. The, already I can feel the winter is in the air, which means if the winter has come, the prelims has come. You know, it doesn't take a long, of, long time for the winters to go ahead. It's, it's hardly anything, okay. So that concludes it, my friends. We will uh, see you tomorrow morning. There will be no delay tomorrow morning, thankfully. 6.30 am, we'll see you with another set of topics. More importantly, those uh, students who have sent me the answers for the mains question will have the responses by lunch this uh, morning, by this afternoon. And we'll look at further questions, further concepts. 
And here onwards, I can also assure you that the Aranya series will be making a comeback this month. So uh, get connected with me on my Telegram channel as therein I'll upload the uh, first information of the Aranya series date and time. Okay. Till I see you tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m. Coder, Revisit and all of you guys, thank you so much for joining. Please consider subscribing to study AQIS English and also connecting with me on my Telegram and Instagram channel. Have a productive day guys. Bye.